Hello, everybody. Uh, honorable chairpersons and distinguished delegates. Today, I'll be talking about one of the very common topics of our day-to-day -day use of clinical practice, that is jaundice in pregnancy. If we look at the normal liver dynamics in pregnancy, we know in a non-pregnant state, liver receives only up to 25 to 35 percent of the cardiac output, which does not change significantly during pregnancy. And the size of the liver also does not increase in pregnancy. So any palpable liver changes in pregnancy are abnormal. The normal physiological changes during pregnancy are the liver function test, may basically the alkaline phosphatase, and uh, alpha fetoproteins are increased. This is because it is of placental origin also, and rest of the enzymes are not altered. So the most common causes of jaundice, we all know, these are hepatic causes, basically the acute viral hepatitis, which we encounter in day-to-day -day practice, chronic hepatitis, and those which are pregnancy-specific are hyper-MSS gravidarum, intrahepatic cholestasis uh, of pregnancy, preeclampsia, eclampsia, help syndrome, and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. We should have a clinical acumen and do a proper, take, take a proper history and do an examination, combine it with biochemical tests and ultrasound. Uh, it is very important that we differentiate whether it is a hepat hepatocellular cause or it is a cholestasis. If it is hepatocellular cause, we all know that we will predominantly find unconjugated bilirubin and uh, ALT and AST would be increased. If it is obstructive pathology, then the liver will be able to conjugate the bilirubin, so we will primarily have uh, the conjugated bilirubin which will be raised as well as alkaline phosphatase. So coming on to cholestasis of pregnancy, we have an instance of 1.5 of all pregnancies in the Indian population. And because of the estrogen sensitivity, it exhibits a familial tendency. It appears usually in the late second and third trimester. It is associated with the common findings of liver derangement like malaise. Itching is very prominent, insomnia, anorexia, mild jaundice which may not occur in all the patients, weight loss, epigastric discomfort. Because of fat malabsorption, it may lead to steatoria and dark-colored urine. Certain important laboratory investigations will include raised bile acids, moderate elevation of ALT, raised alkaline phosphatase, raised bilirubin, and GGT would also be increased. It has adverse effect on both mother and children. We all know that this is going to ha uh, lead to increased risk of PPH. Why risk of PPH? Because it will have the, the vitamin K absorption would be decreased. Increased fetal risk will be including IUD, spontaneous preterm delivery, intrapartum fetal distress, meconium stained lyca, and uh, with every rise of 20 millimoles per liter of total bile acid concentration, there would be a 20% increase in the uh, meconium lyca passage. It is important that we do a regular fetal surveillance. We do a fetal kick counts. Liver function tests are monitored. Bile acids and coagulation screening is very important. At the same time, we have to ensure to give a proper treatment. UDCA is very promising. We give UDCA in the dose of 10 to 15 milligrams per bo uh, kg body weight. It not only reduces the pruritus, and at the same time, it also improves the liver functions. There are some roles of tropic emollients like uh, calamine, uh, then uh, diprobase can be used, and aqueous cream of menthol have been tried, but they are not very promising. At the same time, if you talk about cholestyramine, it, uh, there are not many randomized control trials which have been done on this, so it is not recommended, although it does reduce pruritus to some extent, but does not affect the uh, liver function test. And at the same time, it also causes exhibition of the vitamin K deficiency. Antihistaminics are a welcome change for the night sedation because the patient will be having a lot of pruritus, but this will not have any effect on the liver function test. Dexamethasone, if we talk about dexamethasone, this is only used in randomized controlled trials and it is not used clinically and we are not recommending it. So what is the role of vitamin K? Because we all know in cholestasis there is fat malabsorption and uh, vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. So all those patients who are having a prolonged prothrombin time, in these patients we do give water-soluble vitamin K in the dose of 5 to 10 milligrams, but sometimes few, very few doctors are prescribing it prophylactically in patients who are having normal prothrombin time, but I would like to tell you here that there has been no trials which have been done that prophylactically it has to be given, uh, given in women who have got normal prothrombin time. We have to ensure to monitor the biochemical resolution after delivery, in the purium phase also, we all know that the liver function test 
in some women are raised. So we will defer the treatment for about 10 to 15 days before we repeat a liver function test. The reoccurrence in future pregnancies is up to the rate of 50%. So we have to ensure to tell the woman about this and we have to counsel her not to take estrogen-based contraceptive pills. So COCs are not prescribed. Coming on to another cause of jaundice in pregnancy is the acute fatty liver of pregnancy. The incidence is quite rare. That is 1 in 10,000. And usually it occurs in the late second trimester. It is associated again with three major M's, that is maternal obesity, male fetus, the risk is three times, multiple pregnancy, primary gravida, and of course it overlaps many times with the HELP syndrome. Clinically it presents with nausea, anorexia, malaise, all liver derangement signs, severe vomiting, abdominal pain, jaundice may occur within two weeks, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, DIC, renal failure, hypertension, Protein urea may occur in as, as high as 50% of the cases, extreme polydipsia, pseudo diabetes. So, this is the SANSE criteria. This is a combination of some signs, symptoms, biophysical test, and ultrasound and biopsy report. If a patient is having six or more of these features, then she is indicating herself to be having an acute fatty liver of pregnancy. The maternal risk associated with fulminant hepatic failure, hepatic encephalopathy, coagulopathy, and mortality rate is as high as 50% or more if we do not do an energetic treatment. Fetal complications involve intrauterine fetal death, perinatal mortality is as high as 65%, and neonatal risk in include derangement of liver function test, hypoglycemia, cardiomyopathies, and progressive neuromyopathies. This is an obstetrical emergency. So maternal resuscitation and stabilization is of utmost importance. Fetal monitoring, urgent delivery, it has to be managed in an ICU. Hypoglycemia is treated with 50% of IV glucose. Neomycin and lactulose is given, and reversal of coagulopathy is done by packed red cells, cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma, and platelets. And of course, we have to monitor the fluids carefully and the renal functions. Hyperemesis gravidum rarely causes jaundice. The instance is 0.5 to 1%, usually occurs in the first trimester. We have to manage this case with rehydration with normal saline or Hartman solution. We have to monitor her ketonuria, antiemetics, IV hydrocortisone can be given the CFRS form, vitamin supplementation. Anti-gastroesophageal reflux has to be done by means of elevating the head end of the patient, giving short bland meals, frequent meals, and at the same time, H2 antagonist can be given. Psychological support and reassurance, which is a very neglected part of our Indian setup, has to be done. And termination of pregnancy in inactable cases, which is hardly practiced. Coming on to the HELP syndrome, its occurrence is 0.5 to 0.9% of all the pregnancies and 10 to 20% in cases with severe preeclampsia. Clinical signs present with headache, nausea, vomiting, indigestion, pain after eating, abdominal pain, chest tenderness, right upper pain, Shoulder pain and pain when breathing deeply, bleeding, changes in vision, there could be blurring, swelling, high blood pressure, and protein in urine. The diagnostic criteria, as the name implies, hemolysis, abnormal peripheral smear, increased total bilirubin, fall in the hemoglobin, which will be actually not proportionate to the blood loss, and we will have certain enzymes raised, like transaminases would be increased and LDH would be increased because of the tissue damage and thrombocytopenia. Again, the management is assessment, stabilization, and we have to correct the coagulopathy, platelet transfusion, fluid management, we have to control hypertension, prevention of scissors, prompt delivery, especially after 34 weeks, and evaluation of fetal well-being. If not treated, the complications we all know is abruptio, DIC, retinal detachment, acute renal failure, pulmonary edema, and if not treated timely, mother can become critically ill or die due to hepatic rupture and hemorrhage. Now coming on to something very close to our heart, which we deal with it every day in and day out in our clinical practice is viral hepatitis. That's the commonest cause of jaundice in pregnancy. Hepatitis A, here you can see a picture of a fetus smiling and the mother also dancing. Because this is the mildest form of hepatitis that can occur in pregnancy, the instance is 1 in 1,000. The hallmark for diagnosis is anti-HAV IgM in the serum. IgG antibodies cross the placenta to provide protection to the infant, and at the same time, I HAV infection includes lifelong protection from reinfections. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, 
by inactivated HIV vaccine is very safe. Pre post exposure immunoglobin given within two weeks provides protection for three months in 80 to 90 percent of the cases. And the management most of the time is balanced diet and diminished physical activity until unless hospitalization is required in patients who are critically ill, severely weakened, or having coagulopathies or nephropathies. For the baby, HIV infection in the third trimester given immunoglobin to the baby within 48 hours of delivery. Coming on to hepatitis B, the important markers here are HBS AG. If HBS AG is positive along with HBE AG, then the rate of vertical transmission is as high as 90%. And if you have an acute hepatitis B infection in the third trimester, again, the rate of vertical transmission is quite high. And we all know hepatitis B is quite notorious in vertical transmission. All antenatal mothers should have HBS AG tested in the very first antenatal visit, number one. If positive, HBE AG, HBB DNA, and liver enzymes have to be tested. If HBE AG is positive, HBB DNA titers are more than 10 to the power of 6 copies per ml, and the transaminases are raised, please do not hesitate to take a second opinion from your gastroenterologist. You have to repeat the test after 28 weeks if the tests were normal in the first visit. And if now they are raised, then your antiviral therapy can be started. After delivery, the infant must receive an immunoglobin HBS, HBIG and complete three doses of hepatitis B vaccine has to be given. Antiviral therapy must be started after, may be started after delivery, depending upon the viral load and the DNA titers. Coming on to chronic hepatitis B, when do we start antivirals? Commentations say that if the HBV DNA titers are more than 10 to the power 6 copies per ml, then we can start these drugs, although these drugs are category C and category D. Lamavudine, adenovir, entovir, dinofovir can be given in the third trimester to reduce the perinatal transmission. Immunomodulatory drugs such as interferons are rarely used. Hepatitis B immunoglobin given antipartum reduces the vertical transmission. Coming on to hepatitis C, the prevalence is 1%. If the uh, titers are high, that is 10 to the power 4 copies per ml, then the vertical rate of transmission increases to 4 to 7%. We do not recommend pregnated interferons and rivavirin in pregnancy. It is contraindicated. The only precautions which we take is we have to avoid invasive procedures. We should minimize these procedures like fetal scalp monitoring and fetal scalp sampling. Forceps should be preferred over vent use, and routine episiotomy should not be given. Hepatitis B D usually coexists with hepatitis B. So a vaccination of hepatitis B would definitely reduce the severity of it. hepatitis D. Coming on to hepatitis E, it's very severe in pregnancy and can cause hepatic failure and death. Vertical transmission results in symptomatic neonatal hepatitis. This is a slide we all doctors are very enthusiastic about performing an LSCS in these patients. So LSCS is not an indication for hepatitis until and unless there is an obstetrical reason. Breastfeeding is not contraindicated in hepatitis. And hepatitis C and E, if we talk about these, they do not have any pre-exposure prophylaxis cannot be done. Post-exposure prophylaxis cannot be done. There is no vaccine for it. And there is no therapy practically which can reduce the vertical transmission. So prevention is definitely better than the cure. Thank you.